So welcome to those of you on Zoom and welcome to those of you here in the room for the GRASP SFI seminar series. Today we have Dr. David Linktink presenting to us virtually. He is a full professor at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands, and he studies how birds fly to develop better flying robots. He has his um, bachelor's and his master's in aerospace engineering from TU um, Delft. And he also has a PhD in experimental zoology from Wageningen University. Um, he studied insect flight at Caltech during his PhD, and he's also studied bird flight during his postdoc at Harvard. Before moving to Groningen, he directed his bird wind tunnel research lab at Stanford. His publications range from technical journals to cover publications in nature and science. He's also received many awards. I won't read them all, but they include the NSF Career Award. He was the inaugural winner of the Stephen Vogel Young Investigator Award. And he was recognized in 2013 as one of 40 scientists under 40 by the World Economic Forum. So thank you very much for coming to us um, virtually from so far away. We're really excited to hear you talk. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure to talk in this seminar series and to share some of the research I've been doing with my students and postdocs over the past years. So uh, I'm going to talk about avian-inspired design. It's really bio-inspired design. Um, and it really requires some combination of various skills. So science is actually really important. Uh, and then also engineering uh, to really develop a new design and some unexpected skills. For example, if you want to study how a bird flies, uh, like this parrotlet in my lab, we need to click when the bird is flying actually on cue and then we reward it with a single millet seed. It's probably the cheapest thing in research. Um, and it really helps us to study birds uh, and how they fly and locomote in great detail. Now, uh, some previous work I've done, for example, included the design of uh, the Delphi, uh, which is a flapping microwave vehicle that was inspired by finding the principle that the aerodynamics of flapping wings uh, is actually scalable from small to large. So you can actually figure out at which scales you can use off-the-shelf components to actually make a flapping microwave vehicle work and take off and land like an insect. Another example is, for example, uh, the RoboSwift where actual research into how SWIFTs use their morphing wings to control their flight performance helped give new insights uh, to develop this morphing aerial robot with feathered carbon fiber wings at the scale of a SWIFT. Um, now, and so the way I think really about a bio-inspired aerial robotics, which is really what uh, I focus on, uh, is that it's multi-physics. We really need to integrate various perspectives from physics and engineering uh, aerospace design. Uh, and the design component is actually really critical because we have to somehow turn these principles into a new prototype, a new concept. So why I'm so excited about birds these days, although I'm generally interested in everything that flies, well, birds are quite extraordinary. They succeed in complex environments in which robots fail. For example, the street canyon, there are gusts coming from left and right, it's visually cluttered. It's really hard to fly in if you want to do some deliveries like uh, Google Wing, for example, is planning to do in Amazon. Actually doing this in a street canyon under realistic weather conditions is hard. Yet a pigeon takes off and flies there every day, no problem. Uh, and also what's remarkable is that birds can land on any surfaces, even surfaces for which they have not evolved actually to land on, like these technical surfaces that we developed ourselves, yet they perch fine. How do they accomplish it? Birds can also really fly in complex environments that are really cluttered like forests and uh, locomote remarkably effective there. So how do they actually accomplish this? And then finally, uh, I'm showing here a fake photo. It is actually a composition made with Photoshop because um, what the photo photographer wanted to illustrate is the following photo that's real. So this is a barn swallow in front of uh, a door. And this photo is real. It's actually flying straight through the slit. And uh, as you can see, if you carefully look uh, in the bottom corner, uh, you see that the wings actually touch the surface while it's flying at full speed. So these are soft wings. They deform and they morph. So they change shape. How do birds actually accomplish morphing wings with all these soft feathers? 
Uh, and so these are all questions that I'm trying to answer. And for this, I have a, a big toolbox. Um, so I really start off with key biological questions for bird species that enable the advance we're seeking. And for this, I rely on avian biomechanics, but also actually every as other aspect of biological research that you can apply to better understand how birds fly and why they fly the way they do. Um, and then I use a systems analysis that's really driven by inventing engineering techniques, because if you want to make these measurements on birds, it turns out that the existing measurement techniques often are not sufficient and we need some new tools. Uh, and then finally, using all these new insights and principles, um, we can develop bio-inspired robot models that embody, test, and translate the findings and make them useful. Um, and if you wonder why I'm excited by all of this, well, actually, I have this bigger picture question that I find really intriguing. And that's really how the interplay between evolution and physics shapes the avian flight system as a whole. Because we cannot take one element out of it. A bird can really function the way it does because of everything coming together, like in an aerial robot, actually, or an aircraft or any other advanced uh, system design. Okay. So let's get back to how much visual information birds need to negate gusts. So um, to test this, what I actually did with my team is that we developed a, a virtual flight environment for the birds in which we can change the visual display from a, a display from a cave environment. So uh, a single point light source um, to a lake where there's like a horizon visible um, to a forest where there's vertical stripes. And these stripes have been designed to maximize the optical flow of the retina because optical flow is considered a very important visual cue for flight control. Um, and then we actually also consider different wind conditions, wind still, gusts, and wind shear, so with opposing gusts. And these were coming in at 45 degrees for the bird. So basically we trained the birds to fly in the easiest environment, that is the forest environment with the maximum visual cues, uh, wind still, but otherwise they never experienced any wind. Uh, they actually um, uh, were uh, bred in captivity and kept in captivity. So they had no experience with these types of gusts. Uh, so we were curious what we would find. And I'm going to show you the outcome. Basically what we found was that uh, even in the wind shear environment, so 45 degree wind shear, a pitch dark with only a moonlight condition, uh, visual cue, so this point light source at the end, the bird did, did just fine. It had no problem. And the reason you can see all of this is because it was filmed in infrared. So that's why it's much more apparent than it actually was in real life. Um, so, and what we saw is that the bird is actually maneuvering its bird body into the wind. And the way that it does it is that it keeps its head absolutely focused at the goal, which is this, in this case, this uh, target perch and this point light source. Um, and what happens is that as soon as it flies into the gust, the body reorients in the gust while the head remains absolutely fixated on the goal. And then when the gust reverses from direction, the body reorients while the head remains absolutely fixated at the goal. It's a little bit like at the end of the semester when we're really focusing on completing, the birds can do it too. So here we have some data. And what we found is that under all these uh, flight conditions, uh, the birds have very similar flight paths. Uh, now, if we actually look at uh, some of the yaw kinematics, uh, which were most striking at the biggest effects uh, visible, the rest uh, did not depend on the environment. Then we see actually that the body uh, changes uh, orientation a lot in the cross versus uh, shear conditions. Um, and what's striking is that the head remains absolutely fixated on the goal. And to accomplish this, the bird needs to twist their neck actively, which you can see here. And that's how they do it. So to really understand mechanistically what's going on with their flight control under these different conditions, we developed a very simple body orientation model. So uh, if you look at the body acceleration, well, we can actually understand uh, how it's actually depending on the various uh, variables. So first of all, what the bird does is that it keeps its head fixated on the goal with a stabilized head. So the head remains stabilized. And we had actually markers on the back of the bird markers on the head, so we measured this, that they do this. Um, and then uh, what we're finding is that actually the slip angle with respect to the wind uh, is reduced 
uh, like a weather vane. And this is surprising because to function like a weather vane, the bird would need to have a vertical tail, but it doesn't have it. So it's very different than an aircraft. So we'll get back into that later. Uh, then there's some flapping counter torque. This is a known term that causes damping. And then finally, uh, there is also some proportional control because the bird maintains about a 15 degree slip angle. And so, uh, and it does this actively. And this actually captures the data uh, quite nicely across the entire data set of three birds and 20 flights. Now, what we learned from this is that birds can infer the relative wind angle via neck twist, and they do this via proprioception. So they know where the wind is coming from this way. And so how come that their body orients automatically into the wind? Well, according to the data, uh, they can do this passively, uh, but a bird, of course, flies actively. So to test this, we actually built a robotic flapping bird model that had no tail, so no vertical tail, but also no horizontal tail, and we made it flap open loop, so no control. And we started off at very extreme angles, like plus or minus 90 degrees. And then actually uh, we found it stabilized and oriented into the wind automatically. It's really due to the flapping wings that generate the torque. Uh, that's actually remarkably linear over a very large uh, range of angles from minus 60 roughly to 60 degrees, which is a much wider range than uh, a weather vane or the vertical tail of an aircraft. Okay, so how much visual information do birds need to negate gusts? Well, actually a single point light source provides sufficient visual information. They really don't need a horizon. They really don't need optical flow to make these extreme maneuvers. Uh, so this gives inspiration for designing new bio-inspired robots. Basically what we learned is that the visual horizon can be replaced by inertial horizon uh, through head stabilization. And the birds can infer the wind with respect to the goal orientation, which is actually the most useful for negating gusts. Okay, so let's get back to questions. So how do birds land reliably on different surfaces? Well, to study this, this was actually a question of Will Roderick. He collaborated with another student in my lab, Diana Chin, and they studied how parrotlets actually land on different surfaces. This is uh, filmed here in uh, high speed. So to actually check out their performance, a wide range of surfaces were considered from real branches to engineered surfaces, such as foam, Teflon, and sandpaper. Uh, and then we actually also varied the diameter. Uh, and it was scaled to the feet. And you can also think of this as being scaled towards your hand. So basically there are three scales. Uh, there is the 25%, the 50%, and the 110% circumference. The 110 is really like this uh, perch here that I show in the video that's scaled to my hand by will. Uh, to illustrate actually what the wrapping of 110% circumference is. And you can do this yourself with a drink bottle, um, a water bottle. So basically this is the intermediate one uh, and I can still actually grasp it with my fingers. But if you get a very large one and you could do this at home by getting some large piece of pipe, um, then basically I cannot wrap my fingers and the problem is it slips and it will actually fall out of my hands. Uh, and that has to do, for example, with the fact that humans have nails and not claws. So we have some challenges with this. We wondered if the birds have some challenges with it too. Uh, so to record this, we used high-speed video and we actually split the perches so that we can actually measure the clamping forces the birds actively uh, exert on the perch. Um, and to our surprise, and these are videos for all cases, the birds land just fine on all these surfaces. We really cannot easily see any differences. In fact, they even land perfectly on Teflon, no problem. So they are remarkable in their adaptability and flexibility. So here you see the bird land on Teflon again. It's really incredible they can do it. You'll see at the end, it slips a little bit, uh, but it really holds its ground, no problem. So how do the birds do this? Well, we found out they have this stereotypical approach to the perch where they open their feet and they actually start to pre-shape them. Now, when they actually reach the contact, the surface and make contact, then it becomes surface specific. There's both foot wrapping going on and claw curling. And the foot wrapping, of course, uh, enables to exert uh, the force on the perch, the clamping force. And what we found analyzing the high-speed videos is that this remarkable thing, that actually the claws scrape over the surface to find little bumps, asperities, super fast. Within one millisecond, they will go from one asperity when they slip to another. 
So how can they go so fast? Because no muscle can operate at a thousand hertz uh, for a claw like this. Uh, so basically, they must be relying on muscle tendon uh, and really uh, elastic storage so that it's automatically scraping over the surface. And this makes it really reliable. Now, the other remarkable thing that we found is that they actually changed the angle with which they curl their claws depending on how hard it is to grasp the surface. Um, and to illustrate uh, this, I am actually indicating the different diameters. Remember that really large diameter that's really hard to grasp with your hand? Well, it's hard to grasp for a bird too, uh, including uh, Teflon. It's the same thing that you see next to it. And so basically they, they actually will curl their claws more uh, because they want to get these asperities. Uh, to latch on to. And then the other thing that we found is that the squeezing force really goes down with these harder to grasp surfaces. Because if you squeeze a large diameter uh, cylinder like this really hard, it will actually eject. So this is a problem they need to prevent. Okay, so how do birds land reliably on different surfaces? Well, they land stereotypically and adapt their food surface interactions upon contact. And this actually gave us some inspiration for designing new robots. Here you see the robot that Will Roderick designed. And as you can see, it can perch really fast. It's a dynamic grasper that works within 20 milliseconds. So, uh, and within that time, it will have securely grasped a real branch with moss, lichen, anything. It can be dirty, that doesn't really matter. Uh, and that's quite remarkable and robust because it doesn't know very much about the perch actually. Uh, and so it's really through the mechanical design that this is possible. We're using an underactuated design to dynamically secure the grasp. And some of the tricks that uh, enable this is that actually upon contact, a tendon is loaded that is actually going to stress the tendons and via tendon differential, uh, the forces are distributed. And so this is going on automatically via elastic storage. And then when the uh, angle uh, becomes too small, then there will be a latch that's releasing the spring automatically and then some clamping forces is really amplified. Uh, and then as the perching goes on, there's a leg locking ratchet that really fixes uh, the, the grass. But there are other tricks too, including claws and special surfaces underneath the, the foot that actually really matter uh, for this CR paper. It's, it's really a lot of things that need to come together and it matches what the birds do. Uh, and what we are able to do with these robotic models is not only perch like a bird, but we can better understand the morphology of bird uh, feet. And one of the biology questions uh, that's out there was really, is there a difference between anisodactyl and zygodactyl perching? Because there's such a wide variety in uh, bird feet morphology. Uh, but since all birds need to be able to perch, it's not surprising that actually the performance is relatively similar. Uh, and this is very informative and helps us better understand the biology. Uh, so there's other pressures uh, dictating these uh, feet uh, shape differences. And then uh, in terms of applications, well, it can be used as a mobile arboreal, arboreal platform for climate and biodiversity research. So let's get back to biological questions about birds. So how do they actually locomote in these complex forest environments? So how do they locomote in trees? Well. First of all, let's just think about how they generate aerodynamic force. They generate lift, they generate drag, and they need to support their weight with these aerodynamic forces. And one of the first people to really look into how birds fly is Leonardo da Vinci. And I had the honor to see his Codex of Bird Flight uh, in Turin. And basically what was surprising to me, because actually when I saw it for real, I studied it more closely, I saw this, I saw this photo and I had not seen it in copies earlier, actually. Uh, and it's really remarkable that the way he draws a flapping wing and its motion, because that's how we draw it based on high speed video these days. Um, and then uh, the person who was the first to really make good measurements of what forces a flapping animal wing can generate is Michael Dickinson. He developed this RoboFly with his team, uh, a scaled down insect robot wing uh, that enables to measure these forces directly, um, which is really hard actually for insects. So this was a, a very good application of robotics to advance science. However, um, the open challenge was to actually measure these forces in a freely flying animal. And this is something my graduate student Diana Chin actually accomplished. And as you can see, there is a progression in smiles. So how do we accomplish this? Well, actually, uh, this is based on an invention that I made a while back, 
uh, I developed an aerodynamic force platform to measure these forces directly. So how does that work? Well, we can actually calculate the forces, and this is how this is traditionally done, using a control volume analysis from fluid mechanics. And for this, we would actually measure the flow, for example, behind a bird uh, or behind an aircraft, and then use the velocity, the pressure, and the shear stress to actually approximate the forces. The problem is, however, um, we teach this actually in uh, fluid mechanics classes all the time, is that you need the control volume as a whole, so not just one surface. But there are not many professors, I don't know any actually, who can actually box the entire bird or an entire airplane. So have a control volume with lasers and PIV all around. It's very expensive. So therefore, it, it's very incomplete most of the time. And also the problem is the flow can be turbulent and that makes it really hard to make good recordings with high enough resolution. So how do you solve this? Well, basically, I figured I could box the problem. Uh, literally, I basically uh, imagine that if we have a box around the bird, um, then there's a simplifying condition. Basically, the velocity is zero on the wall, and this is uh, analytically known. So what this does, it, 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 it removes the complex terms, actually, from the equation. And all we need to do is to integrate the pressure distribution and the shear stress distribution around the bird, actually on the control surface. So we use the control surface formulations. Um, and we can do this by mechanically integrating them um, via, and then actually recording them via load cells that are recording the forces that act on the walls. That's all that it requires. And it works instantaneously. And then Diana Chin developed this really nice uh, aerodynamic force platform uh, that's super accurate while being very large. So uh, it's made of, out of carbon fiber and aluminum. Uh, and these plates are actually integrating the shear stresses and the pressure forces. Even the perches are instrumented, meaning that we can measure the force during takeoff, the force they exert on the ground, in the air, via the aerodynamic force platform, and then again, when they land on the perch. And here you see this first complete recording of the forces a bird generates to fly from perch to perch, which is representative for flight in forests between branches. And to our surprise, what we found is that they actually orient the drag upwards. So up on takeoff, they support their body weight with up to 50% drag, which is something no aircraft or helicopter does. It's radical, like it's not in the textbooks. The birds are doing something else. So. Uh, and then when they land, uh, what they actually do is they orient the lift backwards. They're going to use the lift, the blue vector, to assist in braking. So uh, I will play the video one more time. So you can see it. So green is uh, the weight, blue is the lift force, and red pointing upward here uh, is the drag force. And they can reorient these forces by actually flapping their wings in different directions. That's really the, tr the trick. So they do force vectoring all the time in ways no aircraft or helicopter can. And then upon landing, again, they use lift to assist braking. So we actually measured this quantitatively. So not only in the wing kinematics, but also the forces. And as you can see, when there's a downstroke, the drag force in red is pointing upward during the first downstroke and also during the second downstroke. Um, and there's a significant contribution to body weight support, so the vertical force. Uh, it's 50-50 upon takeoff. And we actually measured that during maneuvering, birds can elevate this to 70%, meaning they rely more on drag for body weight support uh, than they do uh, on lift. And this is when they maneuver around obstacles in cluttered environments like forests. And then during landing, they reorient the lift force backward to assist braking. And they really do this at the last flaps, uh, up to 25%. Yeah, so I'm, I'm sorry, can we do the questions at the end if you're if that's okay? Yeah. Otherwise, it's difficult to complete the presentation. Okay. So uh, basically, this gives us some new insight. Uh, because the way people think that birds fly uh, when they, for example, uh, look through the lens of paleontology, uh, they would draw this. They would draw this standard diagram that's very much like an aircraft, meaning uh, birds would generate lift vertical um, and then to support weight and drag is a nuisance and has to be overcome with trust, like we design aircraft. For aerospace engineers, drag is a nuisance. Uh, but the problem that we now have is that if the blue vector must explain uh, the flight of all these proto-birds, 
uh, the very first protobirds really had ill-equipped wings for generating lift. So how does that work? Well, basically what we now found that even in modern birds, birds rely on drag up to 70% even uh, to support their body weight. And all of these wings, even the not so nicely shaped ones and the small ones can generate drag. So this is a much, much more logical way to think about how flight may have evolved. Now there's a problem, drag actually costs a lot of power, but because wing beats are so short, the energetic cost of the high drag over a few wing beats is actually extremely reasonable. So um, this actually helped us to give a new perspective on how uh, evolution may have taken off into the air. So if we think about aerial writing, for example, the cat, well, during those behaviors, animals really pre preliminary, uh, prelim uh, mostly generate drag. Um, and it's really to break the fall. But colleagues actually have discovered that there are these salamanders that live in redwood trees in, in the crowns uh, that can actually do directed aerial descent. They live in California. If you're excited, go there and go look for them. Uh, and basically, um, it's amazing. They can redirect their descent, but they mostly generate drag and just a little bit of lift to steer. Uh, and then if you look at these birds, well, just during normal takeoff, they would support their body weight with 50% drag. So drag is still very important. But then in forward flight, they rely on lift the way we teach this for aircraft and any aerospace engineer would design it. Uh, so it just does show that, yes, there is correspondence and it makes sense, but not during takeoff, actually. And this is new insight um, that really helps us better understand how birds achieve flight. So how do birds use force vectoring in arboreal environments? Well, they actively reorient lift and drag to use them unusually effective. Um, and this actually can give inspiration for designing new uh, bio-inspired robots. You could combine bimodal locomotion with aerodynamic force vectoring to maneuver more effectively to, through arboreal environments and forests. Um, and it would be cool to build a robot like that. But before we talk about such robots in the future, <laughs> let's, let's focus again about how birds actually change the shape of their wing. Um, because this is an open question. So uh, to actually figure this out, we recorded how the feather angles change as a function of the wrist angle and actually also of the second digit. We also measured this. Um, and I would like to remind you of the fact that all these feathers are embedded in the post patagium that only includes some soft, a slow muscle. So, and what was remarkable is that we found that there's a very linear relationship and when we see linear relationships, engineers always think about springs. So um, thinking about springs, we were able to develop the first biohybrid morphing wing. Uh, here you see it. And basically, it's, uh, this robot actually flies with its uh, feathered uh, uh, wing. Let me click a little bit through the video so it plays. Uh, and actually, by morphing asymmetrically, uh, it can steer left or right, as you see here. And it can also do this autonomously. This is a demonstration flight. So how do we accomplish this? Well, basically, there's a wrist joint that's actuated actively with a tiny servo and a finger joint that's also actuated with a tiny servo, because this robot weighs about 250 grams, roughly. Um, and so basically, uh, the motion of these two joints is elastically redistributed by the ligament consisting of orthodontic uh, elastic bands that are carefully tuned to mimic what we measured in the bird. Um, and what's remarkable is that, well, these tiny servos, as you might know if you ever worked with them for robots, are not so great. So here you see actually how the wrist angle changes and the finger angle changes when the servo is actuated. However, the feathers do exactly the same. So the motion is actually that you're seeing is really due to the servo and not due to the fact that this is a underactuated mechanism. And the reason why it matches this so well, and here you see the very small standard deviation actually. And also you see that when we dynamically move the wing or statically, we get the same type of errors uh, about one degree, which is tiny. Um, and it's really because the dynamic transfer function is stiffness dominated. The natural frequency is 50 hertz, while the actuation frequency is 5 hertz. So it's very linear and very reliable, um, which is actually something you would, might not surprise, uh, not, not, might not expect and find surprising. At least it was surprising to us that it worked so nicely. 
Uh, and one of the things we discovered in birds is that they can also actually move their second digit by up to 30 degrees, which is a lot. And so the question is, what is the function of that? And I have no way of training a bird to just move its finger in flight. However, we can program a robot to do it. And then it turns out that the robot can use it to steer. So birds can actually actively steer by just moving their second digit. And that shows how we can learn more about birds using robots. Now, the other thing is, how does this wing stay so nicely in in intact? Well, there are two things. There's feather-feather contact and there's the elastic bands. And now we tested this to the extreme in high turbulence. And what we found is that both the elastic bands and the feather-feather contact is important. So what's so special about feather-feather contact? Well, actually, when we started to uh, take two feathers uh, together, and I have two of them here in my hand as well in the video, if you slide them over each other, they actually lock together. And then there is a force that increases all the way up to about 20 grams, which is about 1 20th of the body weight of a pigeon. So this is actually very high. So where is this force coming from? And then only when the force becomes too big, will actually uh, the feathers disengage. So what's going on? Well, when we made a micro CT scan, we were able to see that there was some contact, but it was actually really hard to discern still. So we actually had to collaborate with Teresa Fio, who had made wonderful nano CT scans. And then when we reconstructed this, we found there are these 3D low weight cilia. So there, these are 3D hooks that stochastically engage with these 2D hooked rami of the overlapping feather. So there's thousands of 3D hooks on the underlapping feather that stochastically lock with about a hundred or so uh, 2D hooks on the overlapping feather. And what's special about them, it's very much like Velcro. However, unlike Velcro, this works one way. It locks one way, and I'm going to show that here in the video, but actually I can move back with no effort. So I can back, move back with no effort. And what it does is it actually prevents gaps in the wing. So when the feathers are elastically distributed, of course, we have no control over them. We are not even measuring their position but there will be no gaps between the feathers because they automatically lock, uh, lock together when they move apart too far, uh, as we found in birds. Uh, so how do birds control the shape of their self-morphing wings? Well, feathers are coordinated via elastic compliance and directional Velcro, of which there is no engineering equivalent. So this is the only directional Velcro in the world. And this gives, again, inspiration for new robots because what we found in the wing Actually, we can also replicate and further study in the tail. So actually recreate the whole bird. Um, and so the reason why the avian tail is interesting is because if you remove a vertical tail on an aircraft, it actually becomes unstable. And you get a Dutch roll, which is what you see here. However, if we now extend the vertical tail again, it's perfectly stable. So how do birds actually prevent this problem? Well, they have this really sophisticated tail that can do a lot more than any other tail on an aircraft. So we developed this robotic version and now we actually perturb the robot with the ailerons, but don't actually control it for the rest with it. And we actually stabilize it just using the tail and it works. So actually uh, stabilizing yourself without a vertical tail like a bird is possible. And here we do it in turbulence. So there's these uh, spinning vanes, the turbulence generation system in front, generating high turbulence. And as you can see, the robot stabilizes itself. How does it do it? Well, we have this wonderful design on the inside um, with eight servos that actually control 40 feathers in the wing, 12 in the tail. Uh, and, these 80, and these eight servos underactuate the entire wing and tail. Um, and it's then aerodynamically covered. And the way we actually control them is via bio-inspired reflexive control. That's actually how pigeons do it. Uh, this has been measured in German papers. So we have recreated this here based on IMU feedback. And as you can see, just based on the pose, it will automatically stabilize uh, its position by making asymmetric morphing motions. 
So it has no flaps or whatsoever. It's only morphing. And so this is how we were able to develop the first rudderless morphing vehicle. Eric Chang is the student who actually created it. And he made his first flight during the pandemic in 2021. Uh, and what's really special about it is that the smallest active scales in this robot are thus 10 micron, whereas the larger scales are um, uh, 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 0.7 meters. And it's completely underactuated. Here it's flying autonomously, um, so uh, based on a Dixhawk racer. And the whole robot weighs about 250 gram, roughly. So it's not very heavy, and it's actually lighter than a pigeon. Uh, and with that, I want to conclude with the first biohybrid robot with soft morphing wings, uh, a rudderless flight that we hope to publish relatively soon. Um, and I want to thank all my postdocs and students for their wonderful research and everyone who funded me and all my collaborators all over the world who made this work possible. Uh, and thank you all for listening. Great, I think we have um, lots of time for questions. Thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, do you have your questions still or? I, I do, does someone want to go ahead? I have a question. <laughs> okay. um, so with, with this uh, autonomous last year, the most recent work, yeah. do you see a path to including drag into the takeoff of this so because i saw you had to use like a, a throw so you get yes yes and and it's mostly using lift right now to fly or is it yep. also the advantage of drag no that's correct and uh, there's a simple reason for it is because in every robot i'm trying to recreate a principle but if you wanted to recreate an entire robotic bird that can do everything that a bird does that probably requires a career or more so no PhD <laughs> student would ever be happy with such a project and uh, me as an <laughs> advisor I would also not be happy because we should have fun doing research together and yeah. to really make a difference it's really sufficient to focus on what's new and so with every robot we select something and of course my thinking as well could we make in the next step you know some use of the previous steps so in every step, it gets more advanced, but it always has to fit within a PhD, which takes four years in the Netherlands and five years in the US uh, with quite some uh, coursework, et cetera, et cetera, as well. So you would always want to be thoughtful about not making a project too big. But it's a great question and we'd be excited to do it. I like it. Um, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Um, I was very uh, surprised to see that you used like real bird feathers as part of your wing. And we also saw that it brought really nice properties to your flight. Um, was that your first choice or were there other materials that you considered um, for the wing? Ah, thank you for this wonderful question. So I actually started out with carbon fiber wings. Like any aerospace engineer, I'm passionate about carbon fiber and cool materials. <laughs> Uh, so we started off, out with that, and that was actually with an undergraduate team. So the RoboSwift I showed at the start was just actually a team of undergrads. So it's a really uh, big accomplishment, I feel, that they were able to pull this off. Now, what's interesting about carbon fiber, they made it extremely lightweight, so it worked very nicely, but it's actually very stiff. It doesn't have this graded stiffness and softness that you will find in a feather. Now, if you then think about what a feather can do, all the multifunctional properties it has at all these different scales, and it turns out that we don't have an engineering equivalent. So there's no material that can match this. You could think of, oh, maybe some rubber here, some carbon fiber there, but you wouldn't get close. So I was really excited actually about this many years ago. And I thought, well, why not use real feathers? That should give us some insight. And it would also tell us if it's valuable to use the properties of real feathers. A robot can tell you that. Like Otherwise, you just stick with, well, the bird can do it. But with a robot, we can manipulate it. And then it turned out that there are all these remarkable, remarkable properties, including directional Velcro, which is a discovery we made in my lab. Um, and it's really something you only measure when you're trying to figure out, well, how does this actually work? So reverse engineering, you have to use real feathers. And then it turns out you can make a scientific discovery where there were about seven papers in total on this, mostly German. 
and the last one from 60 years ago. So here you go. So it's worth using real feathers, and there's still many things that we don't understand about feathers. So I still do feather research. But I would love to make artificial feathers. And I also actually uh, publish the principles that we find. So it's directional locking that really matters and the uh, elastic distribution, uh, because those are the principles engineers should care about. And of course, we want to recreate this in other ways, in bigger robots and possibly aircraft. Then we would not want to make uh, uh, feathers, but we would want to actually develop materials that have these properties. Do you so think that question. if you're, do you think that for um, if we were to build like a larger scale aircraft and then we had larger scale feathers potentially that it would be more achievable to make this kind of ah. mechanism work? Great question. I'm not sure if I would use an artificial feather. I think I would use feather inspired materials and structures. Now, the two principles that were very useful here actually have an overarching principle that really matters. So engineers like to be in control. You might know this from your control courses. <laughs> I've taken them too. So <laughs> we like to measure things and then determine what we actually wanted and then make some changes so it happens, right? Now, um, this if you think this way about a robot or an entire aircraft, you're going to get in trouble if you have many degrees of freedom. So now, if you want to sort of distinguish, you know, you see you flying an object, is it a bird or is it a plane? Well, if it doesn't change shape, it's kind of boring, it's a plane. And if it changes shape and does all these crazy things, it's a bird. And why does it do it? It has so many degrees of freedom, so many that any controls engineer, but also someone who really wanted to make sure an aircraft is safe, you know, would say, no way, we're not going to do this because we need to measure every single position of everything and then actually have an actuator to make sure it does what we say it has to do. And what we've discovered that birds don't do this and that you don't need this. Like with elastic redistribution, you can do under actuation of many degrees of freedom. And by building in these safeguards like directional Velcro, you can prevent problems of occurring. For this, you don't need active control. And that is actually something that aerospace engineers and roboticists will find useful. We don't need to control everything. Just control what you truly need to control. And so that is, I think, the useful concept that I would use if I develop uh, a large morphing aircraft. Yes. Uh, can I, can I ask a question from... Oh, go ahead. Uh, we'll take Pratik and Ajik. Okay. Uh, so I wanted to understand the result and drag a bit better. Uh, yes. Because at the end of the day, the walls of the enclosure, they measure the total force and how we subdivide this into... Uh, lift and drag is ah, the, yes. coming from some definition, right? Yeah, well, that's actually very easy because lift is always proportional to the local flow velocity, right? And that's due to the induced flow of the flapping wing. And uh, drag is actually acting opposite to it with, and, and is opposing this motion. So uh, by measuring the wing kinematics, and these days we even measure the entire surface of uh, the wing, time resolved, uh, that's, it, that's one of the papers. I'm not showing this data here, but that we have. Um, you can actually uh, carefully determine what the lift and drag value is. And so the way the birds accomplish this, and I did not show this model here, uh, so my background might show some part of it and part not, wait. Um, so vertical is uh, the lift force, and then horizontal is the drag force. Now what birds do is, so it's really depending on the direction of motion, right? So in an aircraft, we move forward, so the lift is pointing upward and drag backward. But a bird can actually flap its wing downward, for example, or a little bit downward and forward. And then the drag is actually pointing upward, as is the lift, so the net vector is actually pointing upward, and that's what they do. Instead of maximizing lift or something, uh, which what most engineers probably would think would be logical, they actually maximize the total force, which is lift squared plus drag squared square root, and orient that upward. It actually makes a lot of sense. And what that does is, is that it enables you to have the smallest surface area. So you can have the smallest surface area for takeoff. Um, and yeah, that's why it's useful. And it's, it's also very uh, unconventional, but we could do it with any engineering device as long as we actually change the velocity of the wing or the blade, oh, right? That this is very fascinating. So it, 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 maybe a tiny bit of a follow-up. So I saw that uh, in the next slide, you had the trajectory of the bird, presumably the center of mass, as uh, something that looked like a 
butterfly stroke comes to mind when you swim, where yeah. it bobs up and down and bobs up and down. So how much of this is uh, uh, you're clearly gaining velocity uh, while coming down, uh, but that would be at a very coarse scale. Is there a, a relationship between this thrust vectoring or drag vectoring uh, and these up and down motions? Yeah, yeah. And it's not really a butterfly scale, but I think it gives you the right intuition. Um, basically, they flap their wings downward like this, right? And then drag is opposing that. So that's really the trick. So by just the way, the direction they beat their wings will determine this. Uh, and when they fly very slowly, their forward speed is neglect and neglectable, right? It's very small. And that's why it's really the flapping motion of the wing that dictates where the drag is orienting. Now, when they fly fast, actually the forward motion of their body becomes also really important. And that's also where the logic comes in of switching to using mostly lift during forward flight. Uh, but it's during takeoff when you can just flap your wing in any direction. Uh, and this is something, yeah, we could also use in a robot for sure. I think there was a question on Zoom. Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, thanks for the really interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to ask if, um, you know, there's there are lots of flying organisms other than birds. And I'm curious, yeah. I know your, your area of expertise is birds, but if you think that some of these, uh, you know, findings, or if you would comment on how these things are maybe also seen or not seen in other organisms like bats that have very different wing geometry or even small scale insects or things like that would be interesting. Yeah, no, I actually like every flying organism and also every engineered flying vehicle. I've also studied bats, I've studied insects, and I've even studied maple seeds. And you can learn something from all of them. Uh, if you want to develop particularly small robots, then actually insects are very exciting. If you're not interested in flying with muscles, power, or engines, then actually, and drifting with the wind, a maple seed or any seed that is distributed by the wind can be really inspiring. And bats are actually very maneuverable. Um, and they also have very special navigation abilities uh, at night. So there's like really exciting aspects on all of them. And it really depends on, you know, what you're looking for. So as someone who's also strongly biologically interested, so I also do biological research, I like all these organisms. We can find new principles in all of them. Um, and then if you think about how many species there are, well, there are about 10,000 bird species and we know almost nothing. So I could spend an entire career on bird flight uh, and do fine. And the reason why I really focus more on bird flight these days than I used to do is really because then more students in my lab work on a similar topic and it's much easier to collaborate. But if you ask me, you know, what's exciting, what's interesting, then I think that all these organisms are interesting to study uh, and uh, to use as inspiration. Now, why did I end up studying birds? Well, they are some of the most advanced flyers. They really fly across the globe, high speed, high efficiency. They can navigate in ways no robot can. Uh, there's so many things we can learn from them. They're really top performers. That doesn't mean that, you know, the other organisms are not high performers or sometimes even better than birds in various ways, but birds do pretty well. And so that's why I tended to gravitate to them. And they are also very trainable and I, yeah, I love them. Nice behavior. Very cool. Thank you. It looks like we have a question in the chat as well from Rongqian. Um, He asks about, he says, it seems like the robot is open loop control. Is it possible to deploy any sensors to get the feedback of shape or airflow, et cetera? And is it possible to use machine learning approaches to control such a high degree of freedom system? Well, it would depend on the, which robot, right? Uh, for example, the morphing robot that is just showed uh, is actually autonomous. So uh, it doesn't have open loop control. Um, and uh, uh, so therefore, <laughs> it's meeting already those expectations. Now, what's interesting with the perching robot is that there, a lot of things are uh, open loop and based on very simple contact cues and very simple sensing. And that's very helpful because that actually is what makes it robust and reliable. When we started out with the project, one of the first ideas was to really do machine learning to recognize different surfaces based on the texture and camera images. Uh, and you know, like that is interesting and something you can technically achieve and make sense from an engineering perspective. But then uh, we decided to study what birds do. 
and birds land the same on all these different surfaces. They approach them the same. They don't care about these details. So they will care about the orientation uh, and their other physical aspects that they will care about uh, for sure, but not to the degree that an engineer would. So I am always very careful with machine learning. So what is the goal of this? Now, in terms of making the robot even more robust in turbulence, yes, then machine learning could be very interesting. The cool thing is that we actually didn't need any of this, and that's why we were able to actually make it flyable at a very small weight. We don't need uh, a like a larger computer on board to run advanced models, uh, and that has huge advantages. But I would definitely think it would be very interesting to push this further, right? So can we fly under even more complex circumstances? What additional senses might we need for this? Um, but the fact that you can achieve this with relatively simple uh, principles also helps us understand it. So on the one hand, we could push the boundary by using machine learning, that's a black box. And by focusing really on the principles, we understand what really matters. And then we can see how we can enhance that in the future with, for example, machine learning, which is, you know, an advanced model, so to say. Thanks. Um, I had a question. The, you were mentioning earlier how the birds are still able to orient themselves without the tail. Uh, I was wondering if there was an observation you made there kind of. Course. Uh, I didn't fully get your question. Sorry, can you? So, so on the first portion where you're talking about how the birds are navigating in the uh, room, yes, uh, versus like crosswind or shear wind, um, uh, you made a comment that even without the tail, they were able to orient in a, a robotic system that you created. Yes, um, yes, they don't. So they don't need uh, their tail to orient into the wind. It's really the aerodynamics of the wing, uh, flapping wings that function like a, a wind thing. So it's really the aerodynamics itself that causes this correction torque. And this really happens due to the fact that the wing is flapping. So when you have a flapping wing, you don't need a vertical tail. Now, if you don't flap the wing, you become unstable and you get Dutch roll, as I've shown. There also is another exception. If you're looking really large soaring birds, then tip sails can help you a little bit. But the pigeon, cannot uh, rely on that and will be unstable actually and if you then have this in strong turbulence it'll be very difficult and you'll see that these large soaring birds are all using their tail so um, when you don't flap your wings you need this morphing tail when you flap your wings you don't need a tail and there actually are many examples of birds that lost their tail and fly fine Interesting. And that's really because they flap their wings. <laughs> so the flapping wings have something special. I mean, you don't flap your wings. You need to be very yeah. thoughtful about your tail. Like how close, how close would a helicopter pro uh, propeller need to change to become a, like a flapping uh, wing? A lot. Like just the like up, up and down <laughs> motion and, and the morphology of the wing of the propeller to become a flapping or is it Oh, that Just definitely that definitely extends the lift range because you can make use of dynamic stall. Um, but there's some very specifics about uh, flapping animal wings. So in one of my earlier studies, I've shown that if you have a low aspect ratio wing and low meaning about four, and then with respect to the center of rotation. So it's not tip to tip as engineers think about aspect ratio. I'm really talking about the aspect ratio of your wing radius compared to your average cord length of that wing. That should be about four uh, or less. And then the wing doesn't stall when it's flapping. So that's really special. And that, that's what animals have. If you look at the aspect ratios of animal wings across the board, so bats, insects, birds, then actually on average, they are all at or below that value. Um, and so first of all, don't use a regular he helicopter blade. It's too slender. It cannot operate at high angles of attack effectively. It can be extended a little bit by flapping. You get some dynamic stall, but it doesn't compare to animals. So your wing shape has to be different. That's one. And then the motion also needs to be quite uh, different. But the concept of a flapping helicopter rotor has been developed at uh, TU Delft uh, by uh, Professor Van Holte. Uh, so if you would be interested, you could actually look up a patent on it. Uh, and it will extend the performance and it gives the benefit that you wouldn't need the tail rotor, for example. So yeah. there's already a benefit that's interesting, I think. 
Uh, but to really flap like a bird wing or an insect wing or a bat wing, my intuition is to, that you have to do a little bit more. On the other hand, I'm challenging you to show me that I'm wrong uh, and come up with a mechanism that's simple and works because that would be cool, right? So we as engineers want to have a simpler solution. We don't want necessarily want to recreate the entire complexity. So um, yeah, be very open to new ideas to achieve that. But there are some aspects of the aerodynamics that I would look into. Like for example, don't use a very slender blade. That would not be very effective. Great. All right, I think we're about at time. So thank you so much for a very inspiring and interesting talk.